Well, good afternoon and welcome to this special live conversation coming to you as part of the Jewish Film Festival Synagogue Summer Days program, all part of the landmark 40th year of the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. My name is Peter Stein. Uh, I'm honored to have been the former executive director of the festival, lo these many years ago, and I'm especially honored to have been asked by Lexi LeBan and Jay Rosenblatt and Joshua Moore festival's uh, staff to uh, host the conversation following the remarkable documentary that most of us just watched, uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, Where Now Is. Uh, I want to welcome our ASL interpreter, Matt, and also remind uh, you that you can turn on closed captioning if you feel like it and would like to avail yourselves of those. We have live captioning happening during this conversation. Uh, we'll be uh, hosting this conversation between me and Michael Tilson Thomas for 30 to 40 minutes, but we really want to have your questions as well. So you can make use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens, uh, type questions in during the course of our conversation. And um, after 30, 40 minutes, um, we'll start incorporating those questions into our conversation. Well, since we just spent the better part of an hour and a half or so uh, learning uh, the deep and moving story and background of Michael Tilson Thomas, the man himself really needs no further introduction. So it's my pleasure to welcome into our Zoom stage, Michael Tilson Thomas. Let's see if the technology works for us. Michael, are you there? Mission accomplished, I hope. <laughs> I see you. You are live. You, Peter. Here we are together. Together in this way that the pandemic has made us be together. It's not quite as nice as the Castro Theater stage, um, but there I you are. I was hoping to come up on the organ at the beginning of the show. <laughs> we may make you hum a few bars of San Francisco. Um, <laughs> first of all, well, first of all, wh where are you actually? And, and tell us how you are in this funny moment in life. I am uh, sequestered in West Marin, where it is uh, remarkable. It couldn't be a more beautiful place to be sequestered. And we're in the midst of organic farms, and uh, the ocean is fairly nearby. And compared to what I'm hearing from all of my friends in New York and Chicago and D.C., I mean, not and of course San Francisco, many neighborhoods, it's. Uh, it's a much more stressful experience to be in one of those places. I, I appreciate. Well, you are in one of the great beauty spots of, of Northern California, but it is a it is a strange time, and um, it's most of us haven't had the chance to really see you and and connect with you since the um, sort of sadly shortened uh, farewell uh, concert year that you were slated to uh, to conduct at the San Francisco Symphony, and so this is before we kind of dive in and, and talk about some of the things that, that, that have been prompted for me to ask you uh, based on the documentary. I just kind of want to check in with you as to how that experience has been for you. You really had a big plan for a big year and most of those plans, while there were wonderful tribute concerts and wonderful accolades coming your way, it really is very different than what you were imagining. Yes, I. we were actually in the midst of rehearsing the program that was going to go to Carnegie Hall when we got the news that uh, that was suspended, that the whole period was likely to be suspended, certainly going to Europe. And so we had just done a wonderful concert the night before in Davis of uh, Mahler Ninth, a really spectacular performance. And there we were all getting ready for this enormous tour. And then suddenly, oh my gosh, it's not happening. And the main thing that saddened me is that all these pieces we were going to play, our pieces, the orchestra and I have done so much over so many years that we have a wonderful shared understanding of the pieces. And in fact, it's an understanding which marks how we've grown together in all of these years. So we really felt, felt like this was a wonderful moment to share all of this in a very natural way uh, with so many people in the United States and in Europe, and then we had a huge program of things coming in back here in San Francisco. So I think our m major sadness about this was just that we have such delight in making the music together and really feeling that it goes across the footlights to our audience. That's That was the main, main part of it. Um, 
in the in the film, which of course um, uh, Susan Frumke completed filming before we were in pandemic world. Right. Um, although she was likely during the edit quite aware that you were planning to to um, to hang up your toe shoes, so to speak, um, at the San Francisco Symphony um, and to and to pivot to a new part of your your career. Um, but you mentioned um, that you were very much looking forward, or you were in a transition mode from being constantly on stage as a conductor and beginning to think about spending time reconnecting with the part of yourself that is a composer and, and that you'd started to do that by revisiting some of the work from your, uh, from your early days. Um, and I'm wondering, do you still feel you're in a transition mode? What, how do you what kind of music do you fill your days with as a as a musician yourself? I think I'm primarily engaged with uh, music of uh, the Renaissance and the Middle Ages uh, right now, uh, and and very much in my own music. Probably the biggest focus is my own music because I have a lot of music. I have uh, decades, scores of years of pieces that were begun and nearly finished or were finished but needed in my view a little bit of uh, neatening up and that's my major project is to come back to all of that and it's so fascinating revisiting the music because music takes you so vividly back to a specific time and place in your life so suddenly I'm so vividly remembering uh, these experiences going back to my teenage years and going forward. It's just, I can remember everything about it, the feelings, the time, the place. It's Proustian, the, the fragrances, the, uh, the tastes, it's, it's, all, it's all there. So it's a wonderful thing for me. And happily, uh, as I share more of these things with uh, an audience such as the Whistle Song, for example, that uh, I put out on the San Francisco Symphony website, it, uh, the response to it has been really very, very positive. And in fact, people call me up and say, I woke up this morning singing the whistle song. I just can't get it out of my mind. So that's exactly what I would like to do. In fact, that's to write something, a tune or uh, a, a gesture that really sticks with people. It's always been what I thought about. What is left, left with the audience? when the performance is over. What do they take away from it? A melody, a harmony, a mood, a, hopefully a, a refreshed spirit. That's what it is about for me. That's something that really comes through so strongly in the documentary and kind of has reminded me what has distinguished so much of your onstage communication over these quarter century um, of concerts at the San Francisco Symphony, which is your uh, not just connection to an audience, but your real mission to communicate something specific to an audience. Not, not all conductors or, or music makers really seem to have the audience experience as so far in the forefront as you do. And, I, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what it is about. You seem to be able to both conduct forward toward your orchestra, but very much be thinking behind your shoulders as well as to what is happening in the audience. And I'm wondering where that comes from? Is that part of the theatrical background of your family? Talk a little bit about that. I think so. The fact that I grew up in a theater cinema uh, family, uh, the whole idea of learning a piece, learning a role, was very much you know to find your way. It's very Stanislavskian kind of process of getting into the into the part, getting your take on what the character is, which is a combination of what you read in the text of the script, but also uh, is animated, is made real, is made authentic by your own life experience, which you can bring into it. And that's not necessarily the way classical music is taught or the way it proceeds. Classical music is very, very technical. And there's always a great deal of concern for people starting early in their lives. Are they doing this right or wrong? Like, uh, is this uh, within the correct boundaries? So a lot of what musicians are told is about keeping them in, inside the lines. I want them to color outside of the lines because it, it, what I try and encourage and the way I look at people on the stage, the way I kind of encourage, caution, or confirm 
<laughs> that what's happening is absolutely right on and that they're in their zone and it's all terrific. Uh, that's, that's really what I'm doing in the performance. It's very much about what is about to happen in the music, what has already happened, what has just happened, where we are in the moment. It's about being in all these moments simultaneously. Just as when I think of something like a Mahler symphony, I, I, I can certainly think of each moment in the music, uh, but there's another understanding that I have of it as an entire design, which is all in one big piece. Yeah, one of the uh, words that you come back to often, I uh, just, and again, I'm thinking about the particular quotes that, that Susan and her editors may have chosen in the documentary, but um, you, you speak of the word organized or the way a musician needs to kind of think about how a piece is organized. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, I've, I've really not heard anyone speak about, I've heard people speak about the structure of a piece um, and certainly about the passion that a musician has to find for themselves um, or an intellectual approach toward communicating. But what does what does that term mean to you to, to, to sort of organize your approach or thinking about communicating a piece, not only as a conductor, but as a, as a performer? Well, I believe all the arts are really a mixture of uh, the sacred profane of instinct and intelligence, of uh, the Dionysian and the Apollonian, however you choose to look at this. And so uh, we are all trying to come up with our own lives to where we stand on this balance point between instinct and intelligence. And different composers have certainly had their own very particular balance points. And we can learn a lot from understanding how excellently, how, how uh, convincingly, how clearly the music has represented where they stand in that issue. Music very much does this. So in, in my own process of uh, learning music, if there's a borderline between instinct and intelligence and a piece, I would say that I'm kicking myself back and forth across that line all the time. If there's something that I just intuitively understand in the emotional flow, something I recognize, oh right, that's that. Then, but then maybe I don't get this part as clearly. Well, then I'll kick myself over to the uh, intelligence part of it and say, well, what really is? I see it's the same thing, but it's being broken down into smaller units and recombined in some other kind of way. And then suddenly, oh right, I got it. I have uh, uh, an insight. It's very interesting. I, I I'm I'm wondering whether is there a dual part of your your growing up, either like the influence of your father versus your mother or your grandparents versus your father, that you can sort of map that um, intellect versus passion side onto. You, you, you've you spoken a lot, in the, at least in the film, about your father's remarkable influence on you as, as a musician, as conveying a love and a passion music and his improvisatory approach. Um, but we didn't hear too much about your mother and if you can think now how she may have influenced your career, if not your music. Well, she was very organized uh, in a lovely way. I mean, uh, I can't remember if I said this in the film, but her favorite expression was seize the moment of excited curiosity. And that she had this thing of wanting something that I don't know about right now. I've got to go look in a dictionary or an encyclopedia or you've got to find out what it really is. And she had, of course, been in her career, uh, the founder of the research departments at a number of uh, major Hollywood studios. And that's she had been part of the Brain Trust group in the Roosevelt administration and, you know, working on all these projects and founders, people who founded Newsweek magazine. She was all in the middle of all that. So that was her uh, approach to the shape of things in the world. But she also had one really great quality, which I wish I, I could be, have more of, that she unfailingly saw the good in all people. And in even the simplest things, she appreciated the craft, the attention, the, 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 the gift of sharing that had gone into the making of that. 
it's a lovely tribute and and I, I can't help but think that some of that um, empathy uh, has come to you in the in the form of your your lifelong commitment to mentorship. I mean, what you are doing and have done lo these 30 odd years at uh, New World Symphony and the, and the Academy there um, is a kind of belief in in other people, even those you haven't met yet. Um, what, what was the impetus behind the creation of this next generation New World Symphony? Did you ever imagine that it would be as long lived as it is? I couldn't really imagine the size of it, uh, the ambition of it, the uh, frontiers of technology and music making that it would it would eventually inhabit. Uh, but really, my first orchestra that I got when I was 20 years old was uh, an orchestra of young people. The, it was a debut orchestra of the Young Musicians Foundation. And so I've really been working with young musicians my entire life since I myself was a young musician. And of course, the thing is, I still feel like I'm a young musician. And I always feel, I realize now that I'm the oldest person on stage most of the time. But I think of myself as being the youngest person on stage. Even when I'm working with my orchestra of young people in their 20s, it still seems to me that Oh, I, I'm the youngest. I'm trying to, you know, to uh, inspire and guide them by, with, uh, you know, at times an almost kind of uh, Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland kind of, uh, hey, let, let's put on a show. I know, it'll be Beethoven 9. <laughs> well, it must be very rewarding to see these generations of young musicians turn into truly accomplished both orchestral musicians as well as soloists. Um, but really good teachers always say that they learn more from their students than they feel they impart. And I'm wondering what you learn from your students or your mentees. Well, the questions they ask sometimes are very uh, evocative and, and uh, lead one into thinking about things in a way one didn't think of before. And also uh, in trying to get from them the most complete performance. So the people with whom I'm working are very finished performers, artists. So let's say they have a lot of them, let's say 90% of it figured out. But it's kind of a question of that remaining 10%, where do you go to talk about that, to work up on that? But that takes us back a little bit to theater, but a little bit also to people like Pieter Gorski, that uh, you know, great great cellist, or you know, Rubinstein that I played for, or different people, that that they had this way of saying, well, you know, you are doing this differently than the way I do it, but I'm with you here, 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 but right around here, I don't get it. What's what's going on here in this section? What scares you about that, or what don't you understand about that, or what's what's going on anyway? So it sometimes becomes a little bit between uh, music history, form and analysis, technique, and uh, psychology, because there are different ways that you approach people at different moments, and these th these cause you to think about your own motivations of you know how you arrived at this point, and there's of course that humility that comes in. Uh, being a performer, which is that you pick up the score, you pick up the script, I know for many actors I know, of a piece that you've known your entire life. And you open it and you look into it and right there staring you in the face is the most obvious central idea of what it's all about that somehow or another in the last 40 years you haven't noticed. Hmm. That really gives you a sense of humility. Um, I suppose that's one of the rewards of returning again and again to favorite pieces, because you yourself are changing, even if the piece itself is not. Is there a, is there an example you can give of a piece either in the last, the last year or two where you've had that kind of, you know, I could have had a V8 um, moment um, with a with a, an epiphany like that? Mm, I'm, try, I'm trying to think. Of, I mean, 
in recent years, my in general, I would say that my work with Berlioz has become much more sensitive and tuned into the, the kinds of musical gestures that he's using, and I, a lot more about the kind of excitement coming from the inner workings of the various lines as opposed to playing it in a tempo which relentlessly goes forward. A lot of young musicians believe that by going faster they make things more exciting. And I myself at times in my life believe that. But what I really have come to believe is that it's a question of what's happening within the time. That uh, if there's fascinating those things happening. It's wonderful to be able to hear those. If you're going that it becomes so fast that in the acoustic of the hall in which you're playing, actually people cannot distinguish all of these miraculous little twists and turns. So what they're hearing is just the excitement of pulse. Dun, 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 dun. And I think there's quite enough driven pulse in our society and other forms of music and in the general tempo of what's happening to all of us with the assault of media on our lives that that's not something that as a musician I need to add to at this point. <laughs> now that said, you've been remarkably open over the course of your entire career to incorporating not just uh, dissonance or pulse um, but actual sort of technological innovation into the works that you have uh, programmed as well as into your own your own writing. Um, it, it would be fun to say that it all goes back to the Toodle song and <laughs> which I love that anecdote in the in the film um, it became the Toodle song became a bit of an earworm for me. Um, but more seriously, what um, what, uh, what has allowed you to incorporate and embrace the Steve Reichs of the world, the Mason Bates, um, those who really are pushing the end Metallica, um, you name it, um, to incorporate and give a level playing field to to artists who are making sounds that many uh, symphony audiences are not prepared to to hear. I think the the joyousness of what they do is the common quality there that. Uh, you really can feel their intention of reaching people, connecting with people. And now there's some composers who have a different uh, methodology, a different purpose. Stravinsky said wonderfully, I always loved when he said this, that there's some music that is not meant to be enjoyed, but to be admired. And there are pieces like that. And there are even some pieces like that that I have frequently performed because I do admire them and I cherish the quality of thinking that's in them, even though I recognize that in spite of my uh, championing their cause, it's unlikely that they are going to make it really into the standard repertoire. Now, the whole idea of standard repertoire connected with these occasions in which people gather together to experience some artwork together, such as going to a concert, going to a museum, going to church, going to uh, uh, sports games of one sort or another. All of these questions, these are being called into question at this moment of what we're experiencing now. I, I think there's no question that people find a great comfort uh, in experiencing something together, and there's something about the affirmation that one feels and yes, we all get this, we all sort of, it, it, it reaffirms something for all of us that's very central to our lives. So uh, we miss that experience. And technology has made enormous advances, but in the department of trying to recreate or approach the kind of intimacy and communication that exists in uh, a live performance, no, 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 we, we, we are not, we're not there yet. Yeah, uh, I um, I was wondering. I, I didn't I didn't want to focus too much on this bubble of pandemic um, experience that we're in, but but here we are. We're talking to each other through these mediated screens, and we don't know how long the world of music making is going to be confined to these kinds of um, electronic boxes. Um, so I instead of bemoaning that, I maybe I'll turn it around since you seem to be an eternal optimist um, about. 
um, the, the, the way the music world can move, um, and correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I'm wondering, is there anything good or positive or silver linings around the experimentation that we're seeing now with um, distance playing, or, or is it all basically we're marking the time until we can get back into a rehearsal hall and a concert hall together? Both things are happening, I think. Uh, there is an enormous opportunity here to use this experience I, and the, the means at our disposal to draw attention to different qualities within the music in a different time scale and uh, turning people's attention to different kinds of things in the pieces. Not to recreate what happens in the concert hall, not at all, but to say how can we take people inside the music, behind the music, in, into the combination of backstories, in, into understanding more of the way the performer is this uh, champion who brings them into the world of the composer and what the nature of that relationship is. Uh, and that's what I'm mostly looking at now in what I'm trying to imagine in the projects that we're going to undertake with the New World Symphony, for example, this year. Can you give us a little sneak preview? No, because it keeps changing every day. Uh, you know, it's like, I uh, look, I'm, I'm a very inventive and spontaneous, uh, inventive, resourceful, a little bit crazy person. And I can do something, a certain situation, okay, this is what I have to work with. I can, whatever it is, okay, I see a way to really do something positive and great about that. But I have to know what I have to work with. And that's the problem now. The dimensions of the problem are just shifting so much still. So I've got model upon model upon model of things that might be done and uh, trying to have enough of it in place, in our planning at least, so that when the moment comes to actually do it, uh, we're not starting from not. And, you know, in a way, this is like the New World Symphony. Of course, the New World Symphony now uh, exists in an amazing building built for us by Frank Geary, uh, which yes, allows... Your, your, your childhood babysitter. Exactly. <laughs> which, which allows miraculous things to take place. But the things that the building does, uh, its flexibility, its, its interconnection with media, all these things, it is the way it is because of the program of the academy in the years before the building was built. So the building was built to carry out the concepts of what the academy was doing and allow us to do it more continuously, more consistently. And so that is uh, the same question now. I'm trying to get enough plans in place so that when I really see what it is there is to be done, I say, okay, Plan B or Plan Q or Plan X. <laughs> we'll see which one it, it turns out to be. Yes, I mean one can always embrace Im improvisation in music, but it's really hard to embrace improvisation in a music career or planning several years out in the future. It's, it's very, very. Well, what you say is true. I don't know how many of the people listening to us are aware of the fact that classical music has an enormous lead time as far as its planning is concerned. It's a great shock to people in other performing arts. Uh, I, I once, uh, when I was working with Audrey Hepburn, I asked her, I said, well, Audrey, uh, would you be available to do uh, this show, which is uh, February 26th uh, of whatever year it was, you know, a year and a half, two years in advance. And she was like, I have no idea what I'll be doing. It was in incomprehensible to her to imagine that someone would make a plan that goes that far in advance because everything that happens in films for the most part, you know, you, you hear it, it becomes real six months before or something like that. Um, before we turn to some audience questions, um, there is a, uh, because this platform is um, brought to us by the Jewish Film Institute and the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, um, yeah. I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, having you dig a little bit deeper into um, your own Jewish roots and the, sure. the the nature of the influence of of your grandparents and their the world that they came from on your life. The documentary goes into it a little bit, um, but I had the pleasure of seeing your wonderful tribute uh, show to mm -hmm. the, the Yiddish theater world of the Tomaszewskis. Um, looking back, do you see a particular Jewish strain that 
kind of destined you for for your career or had they been any other faith would you still be a musician yeah uh, well i look i just i i recognize the fact that i'm utterly permeated with yiddishkeit and all sorts of jewish uh, motivations in the kinds of melodies i write and the kinds of situations that i that i create and uh, this is much in the matter of my my father's work. My father was an amazing illustrator and and uh, scenic designer and stage magician and all kinds of other things. And my father, uh, like the other radical members of uh, my family, professed to have no involvement with uh, religion or tradition at all. But in the paintings he did, in the songs that he wrote, there was constant reference to all these earlier origins. And I don't know, I think probably a very significant story back to my great-grandfather, who, uh, uh, Pekka Stamyshevsky and his father also, who were at one point or another in their careers very, very meteoric rising cantors in uh-huh. various in various parts of the, uh, the kind of orthodox and Hasidic world uh, in the Ukraine. And they were making all these events, and then they kind of both came to came to a kind of career impasse, which was that it was said about them that they spent too much time reading plays and poetry in German and Russian, uh, and too many hours improvising on the violin and not studying the holy books enough. So I think that really defines very much the position of. Uh, my whole family, generation after generation, of you know being aware of the sources of things, but wanting to reach out into other forms and other connections of ways of that spirit growing. And of course, uh, earlier in in the previous century, in the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of these things, my my grandparents' theater included, was very much about social issues because they were in their plays exploring lots of themes concerning the organization of labor, women's rights, uh, abuse of children, you know, and, and the whole interesting question of, in the process of immigrating to the United States, uh, what happens in the strata of society? The people who were in the old country, the big machers, the big authorities, who suddenly in this new world uh, seem uh, antiquated or, or uh, isolated, whereas some of these, you know, kind of more streetwise kids maybe uh, uh, can adapt to this whole thing more quickly. And so that's exactly, I think, what happens in many, many immigrant communities who are going through this process of trying to figure out how can they participate in American society but hold on to as much of their tradition as is important to them. Um, you, in holding on to your grandparents' tradition, um, uh, started work many, many years ago on the Tomaszewski project, basically right. an archival project. Um, can you briefly describe what that is and whether it has a, besides the show that you've presented occasionally, does it have a public facing piece of it or is it strictly archival? Uh, I'm not quite understanding what you mean, Peter. That it, the Describe what the Tomaszewski project is. Whether is it is it simply to preserve materials, or is there a is there a website? Are there performances? Are there concerts? Um, how can the how how is your focus on? Uh, well, of course, the major way was the creation of that uh, that that evening that show, and there's a lot of material that supports that, uh, which is online in various forms. But uh, that was an enormous voyage of discovery for me, and. And there's a huge amounts of material that we uncovered that never was not used in the show. Uh, a lot of this material, and when we first had a reading of the show, just to see how long it was, it was about five and a half hours, I think. You know, so we had to realize we had to take dramatic uh, means to pull it all in. But I, uh, yeah, it was it was a very powerful experience for me to recreate the sounds of uh, that theater. Of course, music was very, very much involved in my grandfather's theater. And uh, 
that's you know still a very rich uh, source of inspiration for me. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, and then we'll, I'll start um, taking some of the interesting questions. Um, that let, been... oh, let me say one other thing, because many people ask, wonder about this, and I can't remember whether I said this in the film or not, that uh, why is my name Thomas, not Tomaszewski? Uh, I don't think you answered that. <laughs> okay. The, well, it's, very, it's my father's decision, uh, because my grandfather was so famous. People don't realize how famous my grandparents were. They were famous like Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor famous, I iconic. Uh, their lives were greatly impinged upon by their fans and also the lives of their children. And my father wanted to make his way in the theater on his own merits. And all he had to do was walk into some casting office or uh, you know, production facility, whatever it was, and they asked him what his name is, and he said, Teddy Tomaszewski. Oh, my God, the son of the great Tomaszewski, and oh, like, whatever. So he just felt he couldn't be himself. There was no room for him to be himself. So he changed his name to Teddy Thomas. And then my middle name comes as a reference to my grandmother, who was named Sina, my mother's, my mother's mother, who was called Till for in, in her family. So she had passed away before I was born. So that's how the name came into being. When suddenly my career took off, and then the New York Times was doing a big article about me, um, which was the cover of the Sunday Magazine, in fact, uh, they, the people from the Times called me, and they said, okay, what do you really want to be called? Is it going to be Michael Tomaszewski? Is it going to be Michael And I said, well, I, I, I have to talk to my parents before I can tell you that. And they said, well, you have to tell us within a half an hour. <laughs> and I was in Tanglewood at this time. And I called my parents. I kept calling and calling and calling, but I couldn't reach them. And I guess out of respect to them, I said, well, I have to go with this. I, I, I can't change my name without checking it out with them. That's how it all happened. But fortunately, it, it moved on to MTT, which I've been called something like that by my family since, really, I've been a very young kid. Oh, that was the family nickname already? Yeah. yeah. Interesting, because uh, there's a moment in the in the film, I think, um, where you talk about a almost conscious uh, decision to create a brand or that you felt you had to kind of burst out of a little bit of, of, of a bubble of being in your sort of, I think you describe it as kind of the magic world of your father as an, and an only child um, and sort of create a, a more public brand, and and that's um, I was quite taken by your own uh, insight about about yourself. Was that did that really feel like a conscious stepping out that you needed to do? I think so. I mean, partially, it was recognizing my father was such an amazing dreamer, but it was very difficult for him to get his projects completed because partially because of his uh, his hearing loss and also because of the wonderfully generous but mercurial nature of his character. It was very difficult for him to sustain collaborations with people. So when he was back in New York in the theater, uh, it was a hands-on kind of thing. People like Orson Welles totally trusted him to kind of find solutions to things. And, and he did. When he got to Hollywood, it was all this world of conferences and, you know, executive supervisions and blue pencils and all that, you know, and he just, that would infuriate him. So he was always getting in these wrangles. But I recognized that he was so special and that he was missing this ability to just kind of relate to and form a team of people together. And I recognized that if I were going to carry my dreams forward, I had to do that. Mm -hmm. I had to figure out how to do that. And and collaboration has become, I mean, it's it's obviously music is a, is a collaborative venture, but for the particular way that you've approached making music is inherently um, collaborative, where you have to um, you have to learn how to be a bit of a of a general, but also a bit of a, a conspirator. Um, how how. Difficult yes, well, and again, this is related to the way the way uh, 
director's work because you know the the the, the terrible secret about music and ensemble music is basically the more people who are doing something together the less personal it's going to be because all of their good intentions counsel one another out and it all comes to sort of some comfortable middle nicely rounded upholstered center well that that's not the greatest thing for the performing arts so what the, uh, the conductor has to do, what I believe, uh, what the director has to do is to encourage people at the right moments to take extreme positions, which may be sometimes different. And it was very lovely. Years ago, uh, I did a production of Stravinsky's L'Histoire du Soldat with Patrick Stewart. And he arrived and we worked, I was kind of directing the show and the dramatic aspects as well as the musical ones and we did the show it was fantastic he was just stunning and then at the last kind of party after the show he said well listen Michael this was great you know you should think about doing more directing I said well uh, me I, I don't think of myself as a director he said well I think you should think of yourself as a director and then I came here with a concept of how I was going to do this role and I realized tonight that what I'm doing is 180 degrees from what I had planned and I didn't realize until about a half an hour ago that it wasn't all my idea. That's what I call being a good director. That is high praise from uh, from <laughs> someone with uh, the likes of Patrick Stewart. Um, so uh, uh, excuse me while my eyes avert a little bit from making eye contact with you because I want to start taking a few of the questions sure, of that come in over the q and um, And I realize how disconcerting it is when my eyes avert. I'm not actually doing a crossword puzzle to the side here. Um, Here's, a, here's an interesting question. Um, let's see if I can, uh, there it goes. Um, one uh, audience member has asked, as a parent of teenagers, one of my biggest failures has been my inability to cultivate any interest in classical music. And is it too late? One of the challenges is that everyone is listening to music on their own iPhones. So having music played out loud in the house, as was the case in my childhood, this person writes, has become a thing of the past. Any word of advice on what I should or could do? Well, if your kids are teenagers, uh, there's going to be a certain element of defiance in what music they choose to listen to, probably. So uh, you might be able to do that either to play some music that's part of classical music, which is more energized, more violent, I mean, more scary, whatever, than anything they're listening to, or just the opposite, to introduce the music to them as being a kind of oasis, a kind of moment of calm that people can share together. But there's no question that parents have to think about this early, early along. I've, I've heard this so many times from audience members saying, well, uh, we didn't succeed in transmitting our love of classical music to our children. We we're too preoccupied with other things. But we're trying again with our grandchildren. Because mm. mm. there's something about the vulnerability of childhood when children are learning language so easily and all this, that music is, of course, a language, and to become sensitized to it, and particularly, I think, to have the experience of uh, associating it with the warmth, the experience of your family, that it means something to you. I mean, when we go back into the proto-history of music in these societies, at one time all music was designed to accompany life in some way or another. So there were working songs and sewing songs and uh, stone-cutting songs and uh, w marching off to war, coming back from war, or from, you know, singing at people's births or weddings or passings. or it was, So there was a song for everything. Right. Uh, and so when people People knew the gestures, the harmonies, the way in which these kinds of songs work. So when they heard something like that in a symphony by Beethoven or Schubert, they could recognize what mood, what 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 the message of it was, and also they could say, oh, oh, look, it went in a way I didn't expect. Now, why was that? Oh, I see, because he was bringing me over to here. So they were able to very specifically follow the the, the landscape, the meaning, the psychological meaning. Of, of the piece. And we don't have those associations with music now, that we have mu certain music which is involved in certain activities of our life. So the one chance to do that 
is when kids are really young in the home, that the family together experiences music. I know it's hard to do, hard to find time for it, but it's now, great if you can. That said, you've been very, um, uh, excuse the term Catholic in your tastes with regard to your collaborators and musical influences and mu musical idols. And one of our um, listeners or viewers asks, uh, can we hear more, more about your time spent with James Brown? I understood though that he wasn't classically trained. Uh, James Brown really understood instinctively many complete musical timings. And of course his bands were really tight. He was an intuitive genius. I don't know what more you can say beyond that. Uh, his musicianship, his attention, his perception was extraordinary. And I first spent time with him in about 1971 or something like that, when I actually went on tour with his band uh, in places like Augusta and Shreveport and well, like places like that for, I don't know, a week or so. And at that time, his biggest hit was his hit current hit was Sex Machine and so, and that's when uh, the Shy Lights were the opening act and Bootsy Collins had just come into the, the band and, and he was really working with them and to you know get these things very precise and very exact and working out all of these routines that were going to happen in the stage shows because of course when you hear his hit singles you don't necessarily realize that that was part of a very very intricate stage show including lots of dancing and talking and interrelating with the audience and all that so i mean it was just an astonishing thing to see him at that point at the absolute height of his powers uh doing what he was doing most of the time with no cameras on and you know doing two or three shows a day in a vaudeville house basically someplace down you know down in the south mostly for black audiences, almost entirely. Um, and did you have a sense, did he also come to hear you uh, perform or any? No, no, but very, very kindly. He actually said to me in, in our last in-person conversation, he said, you know, I have never considered doing anything with the symphony orchestra, but I will do it with you. Oh. <laughs> and we had this plan. Uh, I told him that, you know, the New World Symphony, uh, I said, okay, we have the Academy, because the way he worked was he sang things to people and said, do something like this. No, that's not quite it, it does this. I mean, he, that, that he kind of molded the music on the various musicians. So I said, you, if you come down to New World, I will close down the Academy for a week. There'll be no publicity, no one will know anything about it, and you can just come and do whatever you want, and it'll be entirely yours. We won't record anything or do anything unless you, whatever you want to say, but it'll just be a chance for you to think as freely as you can think in terms of what an orchestra might do. And we were going to do that. And then sadly, his uh, death of pneumonia prevented that. Right. Um, that does make me think though, and this relates to a, a question from one of the audience uh, members, um, so he's a collaborator which didn't get to fully uh, collaborate with. Um, but the New World Symphony is a bit of a laboratory for you, I suppose. Are there people, this could be in fantasy or in reality, people that you're really looking forward to being able to do something with that you haven't had a chance to uh, in your previous stages? Oh my God, there must be. But that's like one of these, uh, I've got, at this moment, uh, or. Uh... You can, you can take a pass on that. That's, <laughs> that's okay. I'd love to do something with Lily Tomlin. Oh. I'd love to do something with uh, the Cone Brothers. I'd love to do something with, but I, I'd love to do something with uh, uh, Savion Glover. Something percussion, I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are people who all have changed the shape of whatever it is that they do. And it would be very interesting to see in the interaction between the expanding right, right. classical world and what they do. So, something might happen. It would be, would be fun to explore anyway. Um, let's see, uh, another question. Um, and this relates in a way to this question of collaborating in the, in the time of, of uh, isolation. Uh, do you think Tech, uh, this is from a uh, Diana writes, do you think technology will come up with a way of rehearsing together at a distance 
versus recording each part separately and using a program to assemble individual parts? Do you know? Yes, well, it, it is already happening. Uh, there is a system called Lola, which is a low lat latency uh, software, which it they can push it to a thousand kilometers, uh, but it's let's say within five hundred kilometers, you can make music and in in very much. Uh, the way you would normally do, especially if it's used in connection with Internet 2, which has an enormously wide bandwidth and permits such things more easily. Um, and uh, since since that's already being experimented with, maybe you can, do you feel like this is just a necessary adaptation? Do you, would you feel at home with such a, a collaboration or just accept it as um, a necessary evil? Well, I think there's a use for both things. I mean, the, the opportunity to listen to, work with, uh, hopefully inspire somebody that otherwise it would be impossible for you to meet, that's, of course, a great opportunity. But the actual feeling of community that happens when people make music together, that's an uh, even more special thing. And in terms of what it teacher or mentor or whatever it does, a great deal of what students pick up from their older colleagues is almost in the body language of their colleagues, the, the sort of way in which they carry their art inside themselves, uh, how much it permeates them, how much it shapes who they are as people. That's a tremendous model. Uh, and you don't see that when you're online because you know online is a, oh right here right now here's this little frame and we're basically sticking to the subject right um maybe a piece of of uh teaching that can bridge uh through the through technology is something that that you mentioned to me in an in our kind of get to know you conversation um yesterday and that is this whole notion you you um by sheer um talent maybe luck uh, good fortune Happenstance, you were exposed at a really early age to the the great tradition traditions of European classical music by people who really they 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 lived their traditions. Stravinsky, you knew him. Kategorsky was one of your teachers, and so forth. And can you talk a little bit about? Do you feel any kind of? Um, it's not a burden. Maybe it's just an an excitement and a responsibility to make that tradition connection to young musicians now because you are a you're a living link to a world that has really shaped what we know of as as the western classical tradition i very much appreciate that uh, i feel like i'm someone very much connected with the past hoping to make a bridge in the present to a richer future and it is a question of context uh, that a great deal of what I do uh, as a teacher, which is again back a little bit to the whole actor prepares world again, is to uh, encourage people to give them, to encourage them to look into the context of the music that they're playing. From what, from what kind of culture of what particular social stream is it an expression? And you think that's still an important part of performance because I know like in the literary world sometimes we've we've entered this post structuralist age where we say well the context and who the author was sometimes shouldn't matter it's really about your own response right now living and responding in, in the vacuum of our time and not a past time that's not a new idea that resurfaces every so often in the history of maybe all of the arts we, we, we went through a period in the mid 20th century when hyper intellectualized music was considered the only serious and respectful way of making music. And you can see that in the programming of uh, orchestras worldwide that there was a, a sort of musical language, you know, total serialism, uh, electronics, different things. That, that was what it was considered, serious music was. Uh, and even so there were people like like Lou Harrison, for example, at that time who were writing music which was considerably more melodic and involved with perhaps Asian uh, influences and world music influences. And that was not really considered as to be so serious by a lot of the establishment at that time. But 
it turned out that it had a lot to say and people love it and still play it today and are exploring how much of it there is. Um, as we approach the close of our conversation, there were a few questions that I'll sort of lump together that they're basically asking in a way about your your future plans, both in terms of will will they see you on the stage at uh, on the podium at Davies Hall again? Um, and and I also personally would would like to know what you're most excited about attending your um, your efforts to tell us a little bit about what the 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 immediate future with this pandemic aside, what your um, what your aspirations are, both career-wise and personally, do you feel like you're you're speeding up or slowing down or something else? Well, I'm transitioning to being much more uh, involved in uh, composing, of course, and also in conceiving productions, producing things. Uh, a great deal of what the New World Symphony has done is kind of create installations and or productions around various pieces. And there are a number of places in the world that are interested in exploring that kind of idea with me. Of course, now right now, everything is in hiatus. So more of what I will do during this period of time is, uh, as I mentioned, finish up uh, a number of my works in progress and hopefully find a way of premiering them, sharing them, getting them out there on the internet. I know a lot of really great performers who have some time at this moment, and maybe we can uh, sort of play with this together and see if we can find a, uh, a world beyond click tracks. Um, and will you and, and Joshua stay in the Bay Area or are you gonna move to Miami since they'll be spending so much time with, with New World or what's, what's, that, what's the personal side of things look like? We're here, we're not, we're not moving. For the for the moment, we're not go, we're not going much beyond the borders of our little uh, ranch up here, or whatever you call it. I, I hear cheers throughout the throughout the Bay Area, um, and uh, it, your your relationship to this to the San Francisco Symphony as yeah. Well, you know, I'm now music director laureate. Laureate, congratulations. And I'm also uh, principal conductor laureate of the London Symphony, so I'm my laureate period now. And uh, I keep saying what I'm hoping that means is that I get to do whatever I want and have no administrative responsibilities at all. Which okay. for any of us who've been in the production side of this business, realize, oh my, what a euphoric, <laughs> completely euphoric notion that is. But uh, it's not gonna really turn out that way probably, but maybe it'll be a little more towards that. Well, from your mouth to the goddess's ears, um, may that happen for you. Uh, I'm sure I'm speaking for many in the pleas that you that you do return to, uh, whether it's the big podium at, at Davies or smaller ensembles um, to keep making music for us here in the Bay Area. And a really special thank you for taking this time in West Marin uh, to chat with us and to uh, help us come a little bit behind the scenes of what I know is a beautiful documentary, um, and uh, and and just very deep thanks on behalf of the Jewish Film Institute for spending time with us. I appreciate so much, Peter. You're you're, you're saying that, and it was amazing to me that this film was made, and I appreciate so much the audience that's been watching it. And you know, uh, Hedy Lamar once said to me, "So I've had a very complicated life, and I'm trying to." Uh, write my biography and it's a very complicated story but in a way it's a very simple story which is how thrilled men were to see how beautiful I was and how horrified they were to discover how intelligent I was so I think the simple version of my life story could be that I was sort of brought into the world to be a, a nice Jewish boy, a, a highly nice, highly accomplished Jewish boy. And then for a period of my life, I did everything possible to sort of shatter that image. But as it turns out, in the end, I'm a nice, creative Jewish boy. <laughs> and beautiful in your own way, which is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that straight to Hedy Lamar. Uh, <laughs> MPT, thank you. Thank Joshua, who I know is hiding behind yep. your, your, your left shoulder there. Thanks for letting us into the house. <laughs> thank you, Joshua. And on behalf of all, thank you to, to Matt, our, our yes. interpreter. 
um, and be well and continue making music and inspiring us. We look forward to whatever is next for you in your path. It'll be something fun. Trust me. Good. Wonderful to spend time with you. Bye, everybody. You too. Ciao.